God bless you for choosing to listen to this anointed message from Dr. Reverend Christopher Abulame of King's Tabernacle, where Jesus Christ is Lord and we are bringing the kingdom to the nations. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. One thing I like about the Bible is that you can read you can read it over and over and over and over again and you're never tired of reading it. And there's always something new about it. There are books out there, you read them, you're tired of it, you don't want to read no more. And, and yeah, yeah, you're done with it. You can recite it. But the Bible, it's so awesome and so unique that you can read a verse today, tomorrow you read it again, and you read it again, and there's always a meaning that God wants to deposit in your spirit. Otherwise, we wouldn't need a Bible. Over 200, uh, let's say 2,000 years, I'll say, we'll be, we'll be preaching Christianity, and we've been reading the Bible for so many years, and we can you read it, and generations will still read this book. And we're never, never going to cease reading the Bible. Because the Word of God is, is, is quicker and, and sharper than every two-edged sword. The cardinal dividing the soul and spirit and the intent of a man's heart. And so we go back today or to return to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I'm going to read verse 28 as we prepare for communion this morning. Verse 28 and 29 and verse 30. Look at what the Bible says. It says, but let every man, or let a man, and a woman too. Because, you know, I don't want a woman to feel, well, he's talking about men. No, 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 he's talking about men and a woman too. Let a man and a woman examine himself. He said, let, let him take time and examine himself. It, it's saying, you do it for yourself. So what am I going to be talking about today? Disqualified from the communion. Disqualified from communion. Who wants to be disqualified from communion? I don't want to be. Glory to God. I never want to be disqualified from the communion. Because there's something about the communion that is unique. There's something about it that reminds me of my redemption. There's something about it that reminds me of my covenant. There's something that reminds me about what jesus did when he was on the surface of the earth so i can never never be disqualified from this i do all that i can do to stay and and so he says here he said let a man examine himself after he had examined himself let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that drink it. He that eat it. And drink it unworthily. And that, that's, that's where. A lot of people. A lot of, a lot of folk get stuck. Because it says. He that eat it. And drink it unworthily. And now just take a moment. Reflect on that for yourself. What does it mean to you to be unworthy to come before the communion how is he that it is worthy to come into the house of god but when it is time for the communion and there are folk who feel unworthy how is it unworthy for me to be in god's presence i feel okay coming into god's presence but it becomes difficult for me to approach the Lord's table. There's a disconnect right there. And I think that somehow we need to put the Bible and the Word of God in contest for proper interpretation. And there are folk who disqualify themselves, not God who disqualify them. Them disqualify themselves from coming before the communion. Now think about when Jesus Christ instituted the communion and the day night before he was crucified, it was Passover. And symbolically, we Christians coming together and celebrating the communion, it, it reminds us of what happened in Egypt. And now think about it. If every single person on that day who heard the message that tonight you're going to kill 
a lamb and you're going to put the blood and the lintel of your doors and you'll be ready to eat that meal because by daybreak everybody needs to depart Egypt. Now, think about it. If some folk felt that they were not qualified, what would have happened to them? They would have no blood on the lintel of the door and the angel of death would not discriminate except the blood is there. They would have died. But I, I, I submit to you that every single Israelite person on that day, because they love freedom, did exactly what Moses commanded them to the word of God. If one of them had violated the commandment of Moses, they would have died on that night. But thank God they did it. And so when, 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 when we come together like this, we remind ourselves of our saving grace and how Jesus Christ came into this world and paid a sacrifice to appease the demand of the Holy God on your behalf, on my behalf. What made me qualified to be saved is what makes me qualified to take the communion. Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I would not let the devil mess with my mind. Because if he successfully messed with my mind, I'll be like that Israelite person on that night where they were getting ready to leave and I refused to put the blood on the lintel of my door. And now the angel of God is going to come in. Every firstborn was to die that night. And what saved them was the blood. Not them, it was the blood. So God, God, God's angel was not looking around and asking for their identity are you a jewish man are you an israeli or are you an egyptian no no that's not what the angel was looking for the angel was only looking for the blood wherever he saw the blood he passed so god god is not looking for my identity He's not looking for how you were born, who you were born to, how rich you are, how poor you are, how tall you are. All he sees is the blood of the Lamb. The heart that is washed with the blood. The body that is dripped with the blood. So he looks at you. He looks at me. He sees you and me through the blood of of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now, sin, sin is not the problem. It's not your problem. Okay, a lot of people say, "Well, Lord, you know, I sin against you, therefore I cannot, I cannot receive the communion." You and I have the power to deal with that. You do. As a matter of fact, we should not be in God's presence without confessing our sins to God. You should not be. No. Nope. If you have the courage to come into God's presence, you should have the courage to confess your sins to God before you walk into his presence. So I don't wait until communion Sunday to confess my sins to God. You know, you know for, for the sin every, every single day on a communion Sunday, uh, you got you to gotta confess your sin to God because somebody told you you can't have the communion because of sin and you wait until that day. Suppose you die before that communion Sunday. So every day, every day, when I sin against God, I ought to just immediately confess my sin to God. He said, if I confess my sins to him, he said, he is faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. That's what he said. I take advantage of the blood. But that doesn't mean that I sin every day and I just willfully and keep sinning because of the blood. Don't waste the blood. If you don't have to. He said, shall we continue in sin that the grace of God may abound? He said, no, God forbid. That's what Paul said to the Roman church. So we, we are not to continue in it because we have a remedy. The remedy should be used in unusual situations because we have tried all that we can. But somehow we fell short. And therefore we remedy I was falling short before God through the blood of Jesus. So what I'm saying is this. If I can walk into church today by the new and the living way through the blood of Jesus. 
the same audacity with which I came here is the same audacity that I can approach and receive the communion. So sin is not the issue because we can deal with that. And you ought to, and I ought to deal with it before we come into the presence of God every day. And, and let me submit to you. You are in the presence of God every day. You don't have to be in church to be in the presence of God. Why? He's omnipresent God. He's there with you. You know what we said all the time? He said, I will be with you. I will be there with you even in the close of the ages. So he's there when you wake up. He's there when you go to bed. He's there when you go to work. He's there with you 24-7. So his presence is with you. His presence is not only in church. His presence is all over. It is great that we, we, we honor the house of God. We ought to do that. Because the house of God. It is the house of God. We ought to do that. But we ought to also understand that God's presence is with you in your house. And therefore, his eye is on you 24-7. So I don't wait until I come to church to confess my sin to God. You don't have to. You should actually do it wherever you are. Whether you be on, on the airplane or you be on the train or you, you drive, you are to confess your sin to God. So sin is not a problem. We can deal with that. And therefore, what disqualifies me from the communion but before we go into the specific let's read let's finish the reading he said verse 29 for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily so some people drink and eat unworthily that's what that's what this means that our folk who drink unworthily who eat unworthily and they said how he said and these folk eat and drink damnation to himself because they have not discerned the lost body. They have not discerned the lost body. Verse 30. It said, And for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. What does that mean? Many die. So folks are sickly and some of them die. Glory to God. And, and when, when you look at it from a different translation, it kind of gives you a different meaning to what the Bible is trying to communicate to us so that we can have proper understanding of what the Lord is saying. Let's look at the message translation of those same verses that we just read. Anyone who eats the bread and drinks the cup of the master irreverently, irreverently, is like part of the crowd that jeers or jeered and spit on him at his death. Is that the kind of reverence you want to be a part of? Examine your motive. Test your heart. Come to this meal in holy awe. Now, underline the word irreverently. And that, that's what I want to try to bring to us. Irreverently. And, and put this in context. The folk at current, they love spirituality. They love spirituality. You know, Paul writing to them, he explained the different spiritual gift. Because they wanted to really be in God. But somehow they overdid everything. And so when it came to communion, they, they, were, they were run all over themselves. They would eat until their gluten and spirit is obvious to everybody. The reverence for the communion was removed from the communion. And so Paul wanted to correct that. That you, you, just don't, you just don't approach the lost body with irreverence. That when you come together, you come with such an holy awe. 
Because the Lord Jesus, when he took the bread, he said, this is my body. That's what he said. And he took the cup. He said, this is my blood. To remove reverence from the communion will mean that we desecrate what Jesus Christ did in his death. And so Paul wanted them to understand that the source of their sicknesses and death among them was because they did not reverence the communion. It wasn't their sinful act. It was their irreverence to the communion. So Paul was saying to them, when you come together and you do it irreverently, because the King James Version says unworthily. So the word unworthily carries so much weight, which it should. But we misunderstand that word to mean that, oh, we are all wretched sinners. And because in our wretchedness, we are not accepted in the beloved. Yes, as, as, as people who have not received Jesus Christ as their Lord and personal Savior, I sin. Makes us wretched before God. But when you have given your heart to Christ. And the spirit of God dwells in you. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. That's why each time Paul wrote to them. He wrote to them as saints of God. Saints of God. Paul wanted them to understand. That they carry on Jesus in them. Jesus is in you ladies and gentlemen. You carry Jesus in you. He said, if you open the door, he said, I will come in to your heart. And I will eat, I will sup with you. I will fellowship with you. The spirit of Christ dwells on the inside of us. So the, the unworthy thing is really not the message that Paul is trying to bring to the Corinthian church. But the irreverence act that they were doing against the communion. And because it was against the body of Christ and the blood of Jesus, they couldn't get away from it. Because that is an untouchable thing. Don't mess with it. And so they became sickly and some of them died because of their irreverence act against God. And Paul wanted them to correct that. Paul wanted them to, to, to see the communion as it is. A holy thing. A holy thing that represent the body and the blood of Jesus. And so in our modern days, now ask yourself, what is it today? Now I'm holy. Yes, I am. I follow the scripture. Yes, I follow the scripture. But I, I have also seen folk who either they're afraid that they're going to die or they're afraid that they're going to be sick and therefore they're afraid of the communion. It's nothing to be afraid but something to reverence. The same way that you will reverence God in worship, in your songs, in your praise and your thanksgiving. The same way you reverence the communion. If there was anybody that would have been disqualified on the same night that Jesus was crucified, brother, it would have been Judas Iscariot. How many of you are as bad as Judas Iscariot here? Raise up your hand. And I'm sure none of you. You know what he did? He was with Jesus. He was doing stuff behind Jesus' back. Jesus knew it. He was conniving with the enemies. Jesus knew it. He sold him to them for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus knew it. But on that same night, just as he'd done many, many times over, he was right there at the communion table. And he ate with them the bread. He, ate, he drank with them the wine. Jesus led him. <laughs> Jesus led him. So what Paul was saying is not, it's not your and my unworthiness. Yes, we're not in our own, in our own self. We're not. 
We're not worthy to stand before God and not on self. The only reason we're worthy to stand before God is the blood of Jesus Christ that Jesus shed on Calvary tree. And that's the only reason we're worthy to stand before God. It's the price that he paid. We couldn't be saved in our own self. We couldn't, we couldn't stand before God. He's too awesome for, for us. But it's the blood. It's Jesus who, who is the mediator between God and man. And the awesome presence of God is coming. Jesus stands between. And, and he kind of shields from that awesome presence. Otherwise, we'll be gone. We'll evaporate in the presence of God. So he only allows so much of God to touch me that I can handle. Jesus buffers the zone. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not worthy by myself to come before him. But by the grace of God and amazing grace that I stand before the Lord today. So it, it, was the, it was the irreverence that God was talking about through the Apostle Paul here. Otherwise, otherwise, ladies and gentlemen, Judas Iscariot would not be sitting there. And Judas Iscariot would have died right away. <laughs> Glory to God. But you know that he had a devil... And he was right there with them. And he dipped his hand in, in the bowl. He drank the cup with all of them. And then got up and went to the high priest to betray his master. So the devil, the devil is cheating Christians. The devil. And the devil understands it. That as long as he creates fear in my spirit, he takes away faith from me. And what is due to me, what God intends to be a blessing to me, I deny myself of that blessing. And I walk around unshielded. Say, well, pastor, I'm blessed. Yes, yes, you are. But you know what he said? He said, I have come that you will have life, number one. And you will have life abundantly, number two. You can choose to have just life. You will still live through this life and you go to heaven. But I choose the abundant part of it. It's a matter of choice. You, you, can, you can live your life on earth and not fulfill the fullness of the will of God for your life. That doesn't mean that you're not going to go to heaven. You just cheated yourself on earth because you, don't, you didn't have the fullness of life. Uh, yeah, you can, you can still be doing your stuff without, without empowering yourself with these elements called the body and the blood you you say but you just cheated of yourself from the cup of the blessing you just cheated yourself from by his stripes i was healed now two things i'll talk about before we close today that folk folk they disqualify themselves well it's not god 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 didn't god didn't say you couldn't you couldn't partake in his body and his blood. He invited everybody. He invited them all. And he commanded the church, all of them. And wherever they went, the Bible says they, they continued. They continued in the apostles' doctrine. They continued in fellowship. They continued in the breaking of bread. It was part of the early church. And they couldn't do without it. Because as they did that, they reminded themselves of the death of Jesus Christ. And not only that. But his resurrection. From the dead. Which was the most powerful message. That the church preached back in the day. That Jesus died. And he rose again. <laughs> Glory to God. And each time, each time they preached that message. It created excitement. In the midst of them. And I, and I hope that every Christian is excited. When we talk about that. Because that is the cornerstone of our faith. That Jesus died and Jesus was in the grave for three, three days. But on the third day that he rose again. And he ascended into heaven. Seated in the right hand of majesty. Far above principalities and powers. And every power that is subject to him. For at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. And every mouth will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Number one thing that disqualifies a man or woman from the table is, is false doctrine. 
false doctrine. Some folk have been taught falsely. Lack of proper interpretation of the word of God. When I let false doctrine and false teachers teach me that I am not worthy to partake of the lost table and the elements that are on there, then I deny myself, I disqualify myself as long as I receive that false doctrine into my spirit. Folk, read the Bible for yourself and understand that. If communion, now if communion started, if it's symbolic of the Passover, which was the same, there was a day of Passover, Jesus called disciples and said, we're going to have communion today, tonight, and tomorrow I'll be ready to fulfill the will of God. If, if, if it is synonymous, because the Old Testament is a schoolmaster, the symbols of the Old Testament helps us to understand the New Testament. That's what it does. So that's the importance of the Old Testament. The Old Testament is not obsolete. It's not. If you want to understand the New Testament, you need to read the Old Testament. The Old Testament helps you to understand that. Glory to God. You need to read the Old Testament to understand the New Testament. You can't, you can't just be a New Testament Christian having the Gideon's New Testament Bible in your pocket and that's all you read. You're, you're not helping yourself to understand the full context of the Bible. So if, if this is symbolic of the Passover, you know that on that night that they had the Passover, every member of the family did. It wasn't just the Holy Father, the Holy Mother, <laughs> glory to God. It was every member of the family. It was the kids too. Everybody had to eat before they left Egypt that day. So if that's the case, false doctrine tells you that, well, some people are qualified than others. There's no such thing. What qualifies you is the blood of Jesus. The same thing that qualifies you to be here today is the same thing that qualifies you to be at the table. Glory to God. So false teachers will tell you that you are unworthy. And I'm here to tell you that if you are worthy to come to the presence of God, you are still worthy. If you're worthy to go to heaven, you're worthy to stand before God, then you're worthy to be at the table too. So don't, don't, don't see yourself as an unworthy person. What makes you worthy is the blood of Jesus Christ that washed your heart the day that you gave your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as long as you maintain your faith in him, you continue to be a worthy fellow that comes into the presence of God. Not only in church, but in your home too. Because God is everywhere. In your car, wherever you are, the Lord is there. So don't believe them, those false doctrines that tells you that you are unworthy. Number two, before we close, the guilt of sin. Not sin itself, the guilt of it. The guilt of sin. Guilt will always make you uncomfortable before anybody or before any God. If, you, if you've sinned against me, what, what, will, what will show you out and, and help me to understand is the guilt that you carry. I can feel the guilt. I may not see the sin, but I see this, the guilt. So the guilt of it makes folk disqualify themselves. And so you come to church and say, well, you know, I sinned last night and therefore I'm not, I'm not qualified to, to be part of the table today. Who told you that? Is the guilt. Is the guilt. Even, even folk who already confess their sins, they already told God, Lord, I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not going to do it again. But the guilt of it grips their heart. And that guilt denies them the blessing of it. But you cannot carry your guilt with you. Lay it at the feet of Jesus. It will consume me as long as I bear the burden of guilt. Now tell me, how, how much burden of guilt can you bear or should you be bearing? If you count and number all the sins that you have ever committed since you were born, can you carry all the guilt of those sins on your shoulder? You'll be dead. You will be. So we learn as Christians that as, when you confess your sin to the Lord, 
you let God handle the rest. And don't let the devil remind you of your unrighteous behavior. Because that's what he's going to do. And the more he reminds you how bad you are, what you just did, he flame that guilt in you. And that guilt will deny some people the opportunity of coming through these doors this morning to enjoy the celebration with the body of Christ. Because they feel so guilty and so filthy. But all we need is the blood of Jesus. Let the blood of Jesus wash you, cleanse you, make you whole again. And gives you that joy that comes from your inner being. And, 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 and gives you that, that strength to come into the presence of God. And say, God, I, I know that I messed up. But I'm ready and willing to receive your strength. To be the best that I can ever be in my life. And I determined to do that. You know, folks who do that are folks who succeed. When you let guilt weigh you down, sooner you, you, you'll find yourself drifting away from the presence of God. And the farther you are from the presence of God, the closer you are to the devil. How many of you want to dine with the devil? Not me. I want to stay in the Lord's presence. However, all that David did, he wouldn't mortgage the presence of God for nothing. Because he knew the importance of the presence of God. I, I, I prefer to be, to be at the gate of our God than to be in mansions. He, he would take the job of a gate man in the, in the presence of God than to be in the mansions. Because he loves the presence of God that much. Praise Jesus. So what I'm saying this morning is that God did not disqualify you and me from the communion. You know who disqualify you or disqualify me? It's me and you. Because you let false doctrine to perfect your memory and your spirit. And you allow the guilt of what you did like 10 years ago. If, you, if you're still guilty about what you did 10 years ago, you're not ready to go to heaven. <laughs> you are absolutely not ready to go to heaven. If Jesus comes today, you're not going to make it in. You have folks, Jesus said, come into heaven. They say, Lord, I'm not qualified. I'm not worthy to go into heaven because I committed sin 10 years ago. The angels we have to compel them to come into heaven, get in. Because you're dealing with your own personal filthiness. It's not about you and me. It's about the blood of Jesus Christ. It's what Jesus did on Calvary. In our own humanity, we cannot please God. You couldn't please God. Otherwise, there would be no need for Jesus. We'll be doing the Old Testament practice where we try to please God. Because it didn't work, that's why we have the New Testament. God knew that that's not going to work for you. It's not going to work for me. And so he gave us a New Testament of grace and blood. Praise the Lord. Just lift up your hand. Bless the Lord as we share together today the communion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Just bless him. Take one minute. Just bless him. Adore the Lord in your spirit. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you this morning. Yes, God, we give you glory and honor. Thank you, Father, because we can come together again into this place on this first Sunday of the month to celebrate the fellowship that we share together as brethren and God as children of the Almighty God. And Father, we just give you glory today. Lord, we are not disqualified today. We refuse to let false doctrine to disqualify us from the blessing of the blood and the bread. In the name of Jesus. And Father, the guilt of sin, we pray God that you would just remove it from our lives. In the mighty name of Jesus. Glory be to the Father. Glory be to the Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just thank God for this moment. Thank God for you have the grace to be part of this celebration. Tell him, Lord, I thank you. For you have given me grace to be part of this celebration. And Father, I just give you glory right now. Right now. Right now. Right now, God. Let us rise in the presence of God. And as the praise lead us, praise team lead us in song, just bless the Lord. And just exhort the name of the Father. Just praise him. Exhort him. I know it's customary to say, well, everybody who sinned against God, tell God to forgive your sin before you come. You should have done that before we even started. 
If I have to always say, oh yeah, you gotta oh, the only time we gotta confess our sin. No, it's not it's not one, it's not only when we are about to have the communion. That's what I'm saying. Let's begin to change our paradigm of God. We ought to be able to confess our sins before we even come into the presence of God, whether in our home or at the church. It's reverence to God. Glory to God. You know, Jesus Christ and all the disciples, and they say, all of you confess your sin before we eat. <laughs> right? Did you read that how they did it? No, because there's expectation of God that you and I, wherever we are, is to stand holy before God and practice holiness every day, every moment in the name. If you have been blessed by this message or have a prayer request, we would like to hear about it. Please call us at 401-954-6188 or visit our website at www.kingstabernacle.org. You are also welcome to join us on Sundays for services beginning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 6 p.m. and for Wednesday Bible studies at 7 p.m. We are located at 500 Greenville Avenue in Johnston, Rhode Island. Please remember that you are always welcome at King's Tabernacle where Jesus Christ is Lord and we are bringing the kingdom to the nations.